ES Audio. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. Support with pride. Hello and welcome to the Evening Standard Rugby podcast supported by Fuller's London Pride. I'm Lawrence Delalio and joining me from the Evening Standard is Steve Cording. Hello, Steve. Hi, Lawrence. How are you? Very well indeed. Now, lots of news um, across the rugby landscape. No uh, Nick Puriwell, our regular Evening Standard rugby correspondent. I'm assuming um, he's been called to work. Yeah, he's actually got some work to do today with uh, obviously the announcement as we're coming on air that Steve Borthwick has been confirmed as the New England head coach. Well, listen, congratulations to Steve Borthwick and Kevin Sinfield, who uh, joins him from Leicester, and to uh, George Cruz's old colleague, Richard Wigglesworth. And that neatly brings me on to introducing uh, our guest this week. He's earned uh, 185 caps or appearances for Saracens, winning a staggering four premiership titles and three European championships with the club. He spent two seasons over in Japan at Saitama Wild Knights, winning the Rugby League One both years. To add to that, he had 45 appearances for England, winning two Six Nations championships and playing at two World Cups. And he managed to get himself selected for the British and Irish Lions to New Zealand on that wonderful tour in 2017. It is, of course, George Cruz. And he's also, since retiring from rugby, set up a wonderful new business called 4-5 CBD Business, which uh, we all follow uh, avidly. And we'll let him talk about that in a bit. George, first of all, how are you, my friend? Good, thank you. Yeah, it was a lovely roundup, mate. Thank you. Appreciate that. My personal hype, man. I like it. Well, I mean, you're an incredibly decorated uh, rugby player. So, uh, you know, all of that is down to you. Plenty for us to have a go at and chat about. But before we do get on to the rugby news, Steve, what have you been up to this week? I'm assuming uh, you're a busy, busy man in the, in the run-up to Christmas with, uh, you know, helping uh, Santa and his elves. I certainly am. Yeah. I sound like a broken record because I had another kid's birthday party at the weekend. Which Somehow my wife manages to go out for a bottomless brunch and I'm, I'm left with the kids. So I'm not quite sure I've got that one the right way around. But uh, we're going to Hampton Court again tonight, watch a bit of Christmas lights, which would be nice. And obviously the World Cup final yesterday managed to catch... Uh, the best part of that, everybody's going on about it being the best game ever, but I think for 80 minutes, it was a bit dull. But um, yeah, so congratulations to Argentina for winning that one. George, are you a football guy? Were you following the Football World Cup with any interest? Yeah, I was hoping that England would, would make it through and just watch the whole of UK just turn it as a breakdown. But um, <laughs> I mean, the final, it was unbelievable, right? It was it was like a boxing match of sorts. I just people coming back, getting back in it. And I, I was blown away by that. I thought it was a, as good as a final of any sport I've ever seen. Well, I think the thing about finals is that they can often be a little bit sort of nervy, turgid. I mean, the French didn't look like they turned up in the first half, which I wish they'd done that against England. That would have helped, actually. But uh, I think for everyone watching, the two best number 10s in the world, so for them to actually deliver... I mean, you've got to be pretty gutted if you score a hat-trick on in a World Cup final and then wake up with a runners-up medal, but I suppose that's the way it goes sometimes. Right, let's switch matters back to the proper game. As we mentioned, uh, Nick Puriwell can't be with us. He's been busy reporting on the news. Steve Borthwick named as England's head coach. George, um, you played for England under Eddie Jones. You knew, knew Steve Borthwick during his time at Saracens. I mean, I played against him when he was at Bath as well. What are your thoughts on, let's not reflect on Eddie Jones because that's kind of old news now but the announcement of Steve Borthwick I mean I, from what I can see he's obviously been very successful in a very short period of time but he does seem to bring a bit of clarity to proceedings and I think as players certainly professional players that's exactly what you want isn't it you want clarity about how you're trying to play the game and all the detail that goes with it yeah look I'm I probably should best to state that I'm a huge fan of, of Eddie as well uh, and to uh, you know for him not to have the opportunity to do the World Cup is, you know, he'll be massively disappointed in that. I think Steve and Eddie obviously worked together for, for so long. A lot of what was good around England was based off the back of those two and the coordination they had kind of in different roles, but still leading uh, England. I think both is a perfect choice, unbelievably hard work. I think the, the best thing about both those coaches are, you know, they work constantly and they'll work constantly off field for all aspects of the game make sure that the players have sort of everything in their hands to to be the best they can be so i think between those two like the work ethic is there so i think they're both very good coaches in that aspect and ultimately i think he'll bring in a, a group of coaches which he's comfortable with and i think the coach can be as good as they can be but ultimately it's got to be you know reflective of the the other coaches around him 
Yeah, certainly. Well, I mean, he's appointed Kevin Sinfield. He's, he's brought um, him directly. He would be the defence coach, but I'm sure that there'll be one or two other appointments. Um, I mean, I, listen, I, I think he's a brilliant coach. I think he gives, as you say, detailed clarity. I think the players respect him. His work ethic is second to none. The interesting thing is that, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, a big part of the, the role is is the relationship with the press and the media and et cetera, and, and, and being able to deal with that day to day. Eddie, I think, used to be very good at that. He was quite mischievous. And then over the last few years, he just looked like a sort of angry and sort of kind of like he didn't really want to be there. Uh, and just firing grenades and volleys left, right and centre. I mean, Steve is fairly matter of fact in that kind of environment. Do you think it's something that he'll just have to put up with? Or maybe he might bring someone in to help him with that, a manager type role, or he'll just try and keep it down to a minimum and get on the on the training field? He's a different character to Eddie and, and, and definitely, but I'd, I'd say as equally as sort of captain or all have done his, his background as, as equal to Eddie I think there'll just be different characters in the press and he might be you know a bit of a quieter character but they're both smart enough to lean on different coaches lean on different personality types to sort of feed the media what they want when they want so I'd see no issue in, in how they deal with it if they'll just probably get a bit more of a, a straight bat to be honest well, listen, I've got so many questions that I want to ask you. I mentioned your amazing career. You've won titles at European and domestic level with Saracens, as well as those two titles in Japan, uh, 45 caps. You're only 32. I think many people probably been a bit surprised when you announced your retirement earlier in the year. We mentioned your 4-5 business. I mean, was it that that made you decide to retire and focus on your transition and life after rugby? Or had you just done everything that you wanted to do in the game? Yeah, look, I'm like very privileged to be in a team which has continuously won a lot of decent trophies and then to then go and have an experience in, in Japan and then, you know, also win a couple of trophies there. I, I was pr very content on the rugby side, obviously, like anyone, you know, I'd love to win a World Cup, but I think like no decision, big decision like that is ever made off like one thing. For me, it was like a number of different things, which were my body. I've had sort of eight operations. I want to be able to, you know, walk when I'm sort of full fisted. Um, I think like a sort of sacrifice of weekends, giving up weddings, all those sort of different things, which, you know, not many people make a meal of, but is obviously a big sacrifice. But the biggest one is really the opportunity with the business I've got. You know, we've got eight or nine staff members. We're in Tesco's Boots. We've got another very large retailer, which I'm sure you'll be able to guess coming out soon. And there's just a huge opportunity. And I think if I was to pass on that opportunity, you know, give that another 18 months, which was the decision I made back then uh, to try and do another World Cup, then that's, you know, that's 18 months further down the line, which maybe I wouldn't be able to put into this opportunity. So you must have had offers to come back, though, this season in particular, with you being only 32. Yeah, I don't know what was happening with the second row market this season. It was like uh, when you get people like Charlie Yule's getting ACL, you get a number of internationals sort of plugged in maybe for the World Cup for contracts wise, just no second rows on the market. So there was a good amount of offers more than I've ever been paid. So um, <laughs> the, the cat thing, which was, you know, uh, quite an annoying one to, to give up. But um, well, well, listen, good for you to do that. And, and tell us a little bit more about 4-5 then. You mentioned uh, all the operations you've had. I mean, is it a CBD business for, for medicinal purposes, for recovery purposes? I mean, that landscape of CBD has been active for a while. It's it's a massive opportunity. And just tell us a little bit more about the business. Yeah, well, we set it up four years ago whilst playing, uh, really off the back of using products to help recover and really off the back of that sort of we've gotten now we've got a nutrition range which you know we're wellness suppliers to a number of professional clubs including Leicester Tigers Saracens uh, Mavericks so yeah we've got a really nice non-CBD nutrition range and I guess now we're positioned as a, as a wellness company and the name 4-5 I mean without being a rocket scientist I'm assuming uh, you're one of that and who, who's the other partner we've got to give him a little plug yeah no absolutely um, Dom Day the other uh, co-founder sort of I guess a, a nod to the fact that we both played second row and next to each other at times but that's sort of simple stuff that, you know, simple people come up with. So um, it, 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 it... Don't worry, you pay a lot of money to get branded. So uh, they, they present you with an invoice and you go, well, what is that all about? But uh, listen, we wish you all the very best with that. And, and we shall certainly look out for those new announcements, four or five. Um, just talking about Japan, you had an amazing experience. I think I, I talked to you while you were out there, you know, to go there for two years to probably extend your career. You're thinking to yourself, I only played about, I don't know, 14, 15 games a season. Why didn't I think about this a bit earlier? probably an amazing environment you can tell us about the city you're based in but Joe Launchbury I see has just gone out there with his uh, wife and kids and 
probably not under the circumstances he would have wanted to. But tell us a little bit about what he can expect when he goes out to Japan. He could definitely expect his eyes to be opened. You know, it's not like Leamington Spa or, or, or so uh, uh, where he'd probably been based. But um, look, if you're keen for it and it's something that you go, you know, because you want to experience something different and, and you've got, you know, an open mind, if you pick the right clubs, the right areas with, you know, the right head coaches, it is an unbelievable opportunity. And I think, you know, my phone book's been buzzing probably once a month from people asking me around, you know, what's it like? You know, these are top quality international players who are having a look around what else is on offer. I think the, the point around, like my main reasons, like the point around resting your body up a bit, like it is half the amount of games, probably half the amount of workload, you know, and they are in general, smaller people, smaller teams that you're not playing, you know, Leicester or Claremont or, you know, they're not huge, huge teams week in, week out. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's a, it was a tough decision to go over considering I was still, you know, in line and getting selected for club and country but one that I definitely do not regret uh, I, I went for one year stayed for two so yeah I think you really got to align like the right coaches because you can get sort of that old school Japanese mentality where they'll run you into the ground and sort of comes a lot from the the universities out there where you know more is better um, you certainly picked your club very very well I mean to carry on your winning run and to win two titles is outstanding and we cannot talk to you without talking about your last game I'm not sure whether you planned it this way but uh, you ended up playing for the the, uh, the Barbarians uh, beating England at Twickenham quite comfortably beating England at Twickenham um, I would imagine you probably had quite a good social week in the build up to that game I've um, I've experienced that myself it's quite an interesting team talk actually you have to remind everyone that they're, they're really good players and it would be really embarrassing if they didn't go out there and play you know really really well on the field but uh, you had a, obviously that memorable conversion was that pre-planned or was it just spontaneous or what was your experience like and, and it must have felt weird to have that as your final game yeah, like I broke my thumb in the final or the week before the final in Japan, so I thought maybe I wouldn't be able to make that one, but um, I managed to strap it accordingly. But I think the thing I was blown away with was just how big the week was. Um, they took us to Monaco for the first three days, and that was, you know, just very heavy, um, very late, not much training at all. Well, you've been you've been on a fair few Saracen socials, so you'd have been well trained in that kind of experience. Yeah, but I mean, you're talking like five nights in a row, not home before four o'clock into a. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when you're sitting there on a Friday and you suddenly realise you've got to play a game of rugby at the end of it. That was, yeah, that was the, the fear and the anxiety just struck us. We were like, we've got to play an international team on, on Sunday. And by the way, you're responsible for the continuation of the legacy of the Barbarians. So if you play well, you know, it, it moves forward. If you don't play well, everyone's saying we should scrap the team and get rid of it. So uh, you obviously squeezed in some time, though, to practice your uh, back heeled conversions, did you? That just came to me. That wasn't, I hadn't, I hadn't I've never actually practiced that in my life. It's a spectacle. It's, it's for fun. It's the, the, you know, and I think there is some sort of a tradition that a retiring player ending their career takes a conversion, I believe. So, you know, you've got to maintain that. Lawrence, you ever taken a conversion? I hit a drop goal in a game. It, it's not imagined Zinzan Brook style. Um, this was Leeds tykes away. And actually, I'd caught a kickoff and landed on the ball and popped my rib. And uh, I was desperate just to get... I was trying to walk off the field and Matt Dawson um, threw me the ball. And uh, I was in so much agony. I just kicked the drop goal and uh, and it went over somehow. So, uh, yeah, I leave the conversions to the other people. But I'd fancy having a go. It's certainly at the end of your career. You've got to give it a go. But to nonchalantly back heel it, um, <laughs> you know, and sort of rub England's noses in it was uh... see that that was actually the beginning of the end for eddie you see george it was your back heel that started it all off honor and no none of that george you spent quite a few years as a player representative uh, on the rpa whereas your time working with the england players on on the board the player welfare is is a huge sort of um well it's two words that get banded around you know, it's, it's a big issue moving forward. What was your insight into doing that? And if there was a couple of things that you would want to achieve for the players moving forward, what would it be? The big one is always how many games, the intensity of the games and how thick and fast they come. Say if you're an international player in a decent club doing well, then you've got premiership into European, into international, into premiership and European international into a tour. It's like it, it's pretty full on. But I do believe they're making big strides in this. Judith Batchelor's come in from, she's ex CO. She's a credible woman. She's very straight down the line. She's very passionate about rugby and she's making things move already, which is good. I know they're currently going through an application process for a new person who is an ex-player who is leading on the board side and day-to-day and -day bits. So, yeah, I think they're in really good hands with Judith. And I think the biggest the biggest things will always be game time, I think, and how that fits in with tracking patterns of injury. I, I think they are looking at a lot more data-led stuff because 
ultimately no one can then argue with data as such there is a lot of previously it's been done off a lot of like guessing and and, and a bit data led but i think more and more they're really putting investment into data i suppose the challenge is that you know i mean when i first started playing there was i think four test matches a year you know now there's at least 12 and you know there was only 10 or 12 premiership games now there's 24 and there was only a few european games now there's nine if you get to the final and if you add all those up for guys like you and me when we were playing that's a hell of a lot of games you know big games as well yeah and that's that's the big issue um you know the irish teams have it pretty well worked out they sort of don't play in the urc the top players they just play in the uh, in the european and the test matches so uh, i think you're right i think it's definitely something we've got to work towards but uh it's not an easy fix by the way that's for sure listen we're going to come back and ask you a load more questions but there's a little bit of rugby we want to round up The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. Steve, do you want to give us a quick roundup of what's been going on in uh, in Europe? Yeah, well, just to touch first, I mean, Wasp should have obviously been playing in the um, Challenge Cup this weekend, but weren't. Bit of news from them on Friday, Lawrence, which obviously is very, very positive for them for next season. Yeah, they've been uh, given uh, all the permissions they need from the RFU to move into the Championship and resume that rugby next season, which is, you know, fantastic. Obviously, Worcester were unable to fulfil that criteria, don't quite understand what's happened there but uh, we wish them well it's it's not an easy process that's for sure I still think there's a long way to go for WAS I wouldn't uh, want to dampen the enthusiasm around WAS fans but um, you know that's the first part the club has retained its status and survival in the first two divisions uh, if you like and uh, you know we wish Worcester Warriors all, all the very very best in that process I mean the irony is that we're talking to George about reducing the number of games so whilst it's been tragic news for WAS and Worcester actually there is a reduction in the number of games so it's, it's not going to be a straightforward process but everyone at WAS has worked very hard to get them you know into the position they're in and uh, it's sort of chapter one really of of the uh, Wasps Phoenix situation yeah exactly so it was a right old mixture of games in Europe wasn't it I mean we had one-sided games we had thrillers we had frozen pitches we had teams moving we had heavy rain full stadiums empty stadiums it was it was all, all sorts um wins in the Champions Cup for Exeter Leicester Harlequins great away win for Saracens in Leon, I mean Gloucester hammered on Friday night with the second team. Irish slightly unlucky, I thought, to lose in Cape Town, and then Sale I thought would put up a bigger fight than they did against Toulouse. But Antoine Dupont was in amazing, sparkling form. Um, Northampton they lost to Munster, and they in the Challenge Cup. It was a win for Bristol, but defeats for Bath and Newcastle. Um, George, you obviously must keep in touch with what Saracens are doing. Look amazing so far this season. I mean, I actually wonder whether they could go through an entire premiership season and not lose a game they're doing really well aren't they yeah and look they lose in the final last year after the the journey that you know they've been through the up and the down it's like it's a story that needs completing and i think you know there's a lot of players there at the right age i think clearly that the depth in the squad has, has been reduced but that's not to say that you know the, the young guys are stepping up as well and it's just it's it's really nice you know being in that environment and, and seeing what's happened on the, the good and the bad to to see that coming through uh, i think probably a touch also on you know the fact that maybe the rest of the teams are slightly off where they have been in the last couple of years uh, whether that's a reflection of salary cap whether it's reflection of you know the, the wider piece around domestic rugby at the moment but uh, I think there's yeah there's been a bit of Saracens with some really good hard fronting work especially in the international period they've come out of that very very well uh, but also like I said I, I'd imagine you know there are other teams at the moment probably kicking themselves thinking they could they could be playing better yeah, and Lawrence, you were at um, Quinn's yesterday. Two great debuts for Finn Baxter and George Hare. I thought Finn Baxter's interview afterwards was really, really touching, almost like he was amazed he was even there. But a great result for them in the end. Yeah, no, it was a great story. And uh, and a really, um, you know, listen, it's a, it's a pleasure to award a man of the match performance to a 20-year-old who um, has joined the Harlequins Academy at the age of 13. Um, you know, great story. And look, he deserved it. They were up against a, a racing team that were uh, high quality, um, you know, 
lost the week before, but you know, for him and, and George Head, the, the, the guy next to him, they deserved it. They completely outplayed them at, at scrum time. And it's always quite refreshing to see players being interviewed like that. But just touching on the weekend's games, it's an interesting time in rugby at the moment. The European Cup is not no longer the European Cup. Um, because we have South African teams. And um, that has an effect on, you know, the points that George was making. Coaches, directors of rugby have got to be very careful about how they select their teams. Um, You know, they have to rotate. If you end up travelling out to South Africa, the temperature is 29 degrees there. You then fly home. You're coming into minus two, minus three. You know, you've got to recognise that players need to recover. There's also, at the same time, the Premiership has lost two clubs. That has an impact on how the Premiership clubs qualify for for the Champions Cup the following season. So they have to prioritise the Premiership versus the, the Champions Cup, unless, of course, they've got squads that are, you know, maybe strong and, and deep in terms of uh, injuries, etc. So it is a changing landscape. I think it will be fascinating to see whether the exercise of, of bringing South African rugby players and, and teams into the Champions Cup is deemed to be a success. I think there's always this balance between commercial success and growing the game versus player welfare. I feel for the coaches and players right now. But uh, yeah, listen, going back to the stoop, I'm not quite sure what's happened at Racing. Some exciting news that Finn Russell is about to announce that uh, he's going to be uh, moving clubs, heavily linked to Bath. Great signing for Bath, if that is indeed true. But a good win for Quinns and and they stay alive in the competition. George, do you think it's too complicated this season? Uh, I mean, the Champions Cup. I mean, the fact that you've got the two pools, you don't play everybody in your pool. I was trying to figure out who you do play and then you end up in the last 16. I mean, should they make it smaller groups so that everybody plays everybody? Surely there's just an easier way to do it. Like, is someone just doing that for the sake of it? Or, I don't know, it just seems that, like, like every time I look at it, it's just so confusing for someone who's also been in rugby a while, but also therefore it must be confusing to a fan. It's not like the be-all and end-all, but surely they can make that a little bit easier. Yeah, I mean, I think they've been under pressure because of the World Cup next year to condense the fixture list a little bit um, so that the games uh, in every season need to be over by May, whereas they went into sort of the third week in June last year. So, uh, you know, they're trying to condense it. They're trying to reduce the number of games. You know, now that Europe is only four as opposed to six games, the Premiership is only, they've lost two clubs, maybe... There might be some leeway there, but I, I agree with you. It is what it means is if you lose your first game, you're in serious trouble, really, of qualifying, and certainly in terms of getting yourself a home last 16 uh, game or or a seeding. So it's uh, it's pretty tricky, that's for sure. So we normally have an outstanding section. Outstanding, supported by Fuller's London Pride. I'm going to ask you, Steve, to pick out your outstanding player from across the weekend. I'll have to uh, give it to Antoine Dupont. I thought his uh, his overall performance against Sale was superb. I mean, I did think Sale were going to give them a firmer test than they did, but he just showed it far and away again why he's one of the best, if not the best player in Europe right now. Easy for you. Glory hunter, mate, just picking out the big names. Like that. <laughs> you know, clearly a football man. He's just turned his attention to rugby and thought, I'll go with Antoine Dupont. <laughs> Um, I am going to go with a guy that, um, that George and I know very, very well. Uh, his name is Dan Cole. I think I'm, I'm right in saying he played his 300th game for Leicester Tigers uh, this weekend. Yeah, I'm not watching it. He was uh, good. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, look, he, you know, the irony is that, he, you know, as it, Alan Walters has arrived at Tigers, they finally realised that, you know, they don't have to kick the living crap out of each other every single day. Um, and that actually uh, getting yourself ready for games, even at the age that he is, is the most important thing. And he seems to be fitter and, and in, in the best shape of his life, which is fantastic. But I think, you know, anyone who's played at the cold face like that, literally, uh, no pun intended, deserves to be uh, known as outstanding. So Dan Cole. Uh, George, any uh, anyone stand out for you? I actually would have gone with Cole as well. I watched the game. He had a, an amazing reception, both on and off the field. You know, he's a guy who's played plenty of caps, been through some ups and downs, you know, and he may well find himself back in an England shirt. Like these things come back around, especially with Steve Binner at Leicester as well. So I think he's been brilliant for England for, for the Premiership for a number of years. And yeah, testament to him for picking up man of matches on, on his three hundreds as well. Actually, can I give special mention to Justin Tipperick? Because the one result that we haven't mentioned so far is the Ospreys win uh, Montpellier, which has to go down, I think, as the result of the weekend. That was the biggest surprise without doubt but they put in a superb performance and actually 
hopefully have given the Welsh a little bit of relevance in the Champions Cup because of what they'd lost 11 in a row. It's amazing when um, when there's a change of coach, suddenly there's um, there's a few big performances. You know, Warren Gatland uh, is, is is obviously taking the, the reins again at, at Wales, which is a fascinating appointment to go back and potentially, uh, you know, put everything you've achieved under a little bit of uh, threat. But uh, I agree. I thought it was outstanding. I'm not quite sure how the French champions contrived to lose the game, having already done the hard work and beaten uh, London Irish the week before. But... You know, the French can do that, can't they? Self-destruct. But no, great call. Um, George, if you're OK, we're, you're going to be uh, tackled. Um, we have a few quick fire questions just for our listeners to get to know you a bit better. Tackled. Supported by Fuller's London Pride. Your full name, please, sir. George Edward John Cruz. King's names. King's names, absolutely. Uh, favourite takeaway? And now you've been in Japan, that might have changed. But what's your favourite takeaway? Uh, a tie takeaway. Very happy with that. Uh, any celebrity crush in the in the past? Summer of the OT was my my childhood crush. I, I still don't know her name, so obviously I don't, I don't crush her that too hard. Uh, what was the last movie that you watched? Uh, actually, actually, shocking one. Um, very informative. Real upgrade. It was called Troll, and it was on Netflix. It was <laughs> it was a hungover sort of uh, easy watch. What did you have for breakfast? Or when you, okay, when you were playing, what would you have had for breakfast? Porridge. Pretty easy. Like Saracens would have done a good breakfast meal. In Japan, they do like, you know, it's rice and sort of curries. It's, it was. Well, to be honest, in Japan, in Tokyo, I woke up with my wife to a bento box and phew, I thought, I thought look, I mean, there's no way you'd eat that for lunch or dinner, let alone breakfast. <laughs> there were things alive on that plate, is all I would say. Um, your nickname, is it? Is it the obvious one? Just put a Y on the end, a cruisy? It's more O on the end. I've got, people have gone cruzo. What's the best advice that you've been given? Um, it doesn't have to be too deep. It could be quite rugby related or it just could be life related. Keep learning was the best advice. That's very good. Um, in your contact book, on your phone book, who would you say is the most famous person you have in there? For you, mate. Uh, well, infamous. That's the, I mean, I definitely tick that box. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. I don't have anyone too special on there. Okay. So mainly just all your mates, really. That's good. Um, who would play you in a film about your life? Probably the person who did Scooby Doo in the Scooby Doo movie. Steve, help us out. There. Help us out. Shag- there, you mean you mean Shaggy? Shaggy, but they, there wasn't there like an actual Scooby Doo movie, so maybe that one. But I, I don't know. Um, that or Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Is that <laughs> don't don't be uh, don't unashamedly. I mean, we've gone from Shaggy to Brad Pitt. I can see the similarities, yeah. buddy. I can see I mean, the same hair color. Um, who is uh, the funniest person that you know, or who was the funniest person when you were on the team bus or, or in the in the England team or the Saracens team? Is that an easy answer? Uh, I got Alex Zoski. He's unique. His sense of humor is confusing. It's brilliant. You just don't know when or what what he's going to come up with. It's it's endless endless joy. And you, and he doesn't even have to say a lot of stuff. You you can watch the, the puzzle expressions on his face, and you know exactly what he's. <laughs> Uh, he's good. He's top draw. Love it. Are you a uh, a dog or a cat person? Dog, hundred percent. Do you have a dog? I do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what type of dog is yeah, it? Is, is it a little a little pooch or is it something that's slightly bigger? I carry it around in a little bag. Yeah. No, uh, it's a Vizsla. Ah, oh, good man. And when you have to perform a karaoke song um, after the multiple trophies that you've won, what's your go-to uh, tune? Oh, anything Elton John? Maybe Purple Rain as well. Prince. It has to be something the lads can get behind. Otherwise, it's yeah. a lot. Otherwise, they just they just shout you down, and then you're off on you really. So, uh, which superhero would you most like to be, Mister Invisible? That would be mine, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Superman would would be all right for me. I think like to fly. I think would be would be epic. Brilliant. Who is the best rugby player of all time? Who was the person that made you stand up and go, wow? Let's make it more specific. Who would be the second row that you would just go, wow? That he was the best lock of all time. Well, to be honest. I- like playing both with uh, Will Skelton and Marrow, they offer just some very unique things. Like Marrow's obviously extremely well rounded and a brilliant player. Skelton, I think, is like a, a coach's like perfect player in terms of like you could just use it. A good coach can use him in a number of different ways and sort of can really build a, a like a game plan I, around yeah. it. I mean, I don't understand. I don't know in the modern game without an arsenal of weaponry how you could get. How can you remove a player like that from the ball once once he's on the ball? I mean, it's just impossible. Absolutely impossible. Um, now, this is a question that we ask everyone because we are a Premiership podcast. But you've had some amazing days in Premiership rugby. What is your proudest and most memorable, well, premiership moment? And then I'm going to ask you rugby moment. But what was your proudest premiership moment? Probably any any time beating Exeter, to be honest. Preferably in the final. Darkest one was also getting beaten by them in the semi-final down there. So they got that last laugh. But um, 
No, nah, I'd say the finals are brilliant just because it comes with the when you're with your club and you you know it's day to day, you've got such tight bonds, and then it's the end. It signifies the end of the season, and there's always a good day or two blowout. And I think when you you know what what people don't realise is when you look around, there's obviously you're lucky enough to be on the pitch as I was, but actually at the end of the final whistle, if it's gone your way, all of the guys who who you've been training with all season, all there, you know, all the support staff. And it's, you realise it's more than just about the experience on the day. It's about the whole year. And then if, if I was to put you on the spot, what was your, your proudest moment in rugby? Would it be your, you know, your first England cap and giving that to your mum and dad? Would it be your first Lions cap? I'm, I have no idea. Yeah, I, like international for me is huge. I stand by the fact that, and that's not to, to um, take away from everything that, you know, the privilege of, of England and so on. But, you know, I, I played 14 years or so with a group of players at, at Saracens and I think that some of those memories so the, the European game against Leinster the final you know going down at, I'd say we had a yellow card and we were 10 points down at half times and then to turn that around I'd say those sort of ones are probably just pippet for me also the Barbars game I had sort of 90 odd friends and family watching that you know and I don't mind the, the lighter hearted sort of side of, of rugby as well so that was quite fun George, that was a great memory to end today's podcast. We wish you all the very best with your continued success with 4-5. Uh, our listeners will now be avid fans and we'll be going out to buy it. Thanks very much for joining us on the podcast and, uh, and have a happy Christmas, my friend. Thank you very much. Cheers for having me. So that's all for this episode of the Evening Standard Rugby podcast, supported by Fuller's London Pride. And in fact, that's all from us this year. So it only remains for me to say thank you to everyone who's appeared on our podcast during 2022. A special thanks to you for listening. I hope everyone has a happy Christmas and a wonderful new year. And we'll see you in the new year. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, Supported by Fuller's London Pride. Official beer of Premiership Rugby. Support with pride.